Hello, everyone, and welcome. My name is Chelsea Luciani. I'm a senior manager with the Trade Policy and Negotiations Branch in the BC Ministry of Jobs, Economic Development, and Competitiveness. I'm joined by my colleague Scanna Drogs, who's a manager, and Ben Kalosnik, a senior manager, and I will be sharing presenting duties with them today. We are so pleased that you're able to join us virtually this morning for the webinar on the new Canada-United States-Mexico Agreement, otherwise known as the CUSMA. We hope the session will be useful to you. This morning, we'd like to cover a high-level overview of the CUSMA before going into the key differences between the CUSMA and the original NAFTA. We'd like to talk a little bit about the key areas that are covered under the CUSMA and how it applies to goods, services, business entry, digital trade, investment, and inclusive trade. We'd also like to leave you with an overview of where Canada and BC's other FTAs are and some recent developments in the FTA landscape. These were presented by my colleague Dana. Ben will then go over the resources and trade services that are available to you and where you can find information on them. As you know, the CUSMA, called the USMCA by the US and TMEC by Mexico, replaced the 26-year-old NAFTA on July 1, 2020. The renegotiations that resulted in the CUSMA began in August 2017 at the US's request. As you recall, renegotiating the NAFTA was a major campaign priority of US President Trump. The resulting CUSMA modernizes several elements of the NAFTA, taking into account developments and improvements since the NAFTA entered into force 26 years ago. Importantly, the CUSMA retains key elements of the NAFTA and our preferential access to the US and Mexico have been preserved. It is a comprehensive agreement with 34 chapters covering areas like goods, services, investment, digital trade, intellectual property, labor, environment, inclusive trade, and so on. It's also important to note that this agreement is subject to dispute settlement. Now, we expect the CUSMA to provide additional certainty and transparency, though it is important to note that no FTA will remove uncertainty completely. What FTAs do is that it provides a set of agreed upon rules and a framework for addressing issues should they come up. So let's talk a little bit about what has changed and what has stayed the same between the CUSMA and the NAFTA. We'll start with some key areas that are essentially the same. Firstly, the NAFTA eliminated virtually all tariffs on almost all goods in 1994. This preferential access to the US and Mexico has been carried over into the CUSMA. Very importantly, as I mentioned earlier, the NAFTA's dispute settlement mechanism has been preserved. This has been used by Canada on several occasions, and this mechanism remains intact with some improvements. Another area that is essentially the same is our temporary entry access to the US and Mexico, and vice versa. So what this does is it allows certain professions and categories of business visitors to enter temporarily to do business, service and investment, and so on. On government procurement, Canada and the US chose to rely on what they had agreed to under the WTO Agreement on Government Procurement, rather than including government procurement between them under the CUSMA. Therefore, the access under the agreement on government procurement is actually better than what was in the original NAFTA, and since BC companies have had access to this for several years now, this is effectively a status quo outcome. Finally, although Canada granted additional incremental quota access for dairy, eggs, and poultry, Canada's system of supply management remains intact under the CUSMA. So moving on to some of the key changes between the CUSMA and the NAFTA. First off, there is a new digital trade chapter. E-commerce, of course, being a key development in the international trade landscape since the original NAFTA was negotiated. There are now also chapters on labor and environment contained within the agreement. Under the NAFTA, they were side agreements. Canada and Mexico have also agreed to a facility-specific rapid response labor mechanism between them. An important change between the NAFTA and the CUSMA is that the NAFTA's investor state dispute settlement also called ISDS, is being phased out under the CUSMA. The agreement also has an annex on alcoholic beverages, so it includes commitments on treating imports from the FTA region similar to domestic products and reduces and streamlines labeling requirements for wine and distilled spirits. The CUSMA also has stricter rules of origin, that is, the amount of domestic content required for a good to be considered from Canada the US or Mexico for autos, auto parts, and textiles. 
Some additional differences between the agreements are, is that Canada has agreed to incremental quota access for dairy, poultry, and eggs. The U.S. in turn has agreed to additional access for us to send sugar, sugar-containing products, and certain dairy products into the U.S. With respect to energy, the agreement no longer includes what was once referred to as the Energy Proportionality Clause. So this had placed certain limitations on the ability of parties to constrain the export of energy products. This is now gone. The KUSMA now includes a requirement for a formal review of the agreement at least every six years after entering into force. This new review process will help ensure the agreement remains relevant and also help us address issues before they become major challenges. Parties can agree to extend the agreement 16 years after each review. I'd like to talk now about how the KUSMA applies to key areas, starting with goods. The KUSMA seeks to facilitate the trade in goods in several ways, including through maintaining the NAFTA's 0% tariffs on almost all goods. So the vast majority of North American trade will continue to be duty-free under the KUSMA. In the resources section, Ben will go over using the Canada Tariff Finder website so you can figure out if your goods have tariffs on them or not. For goods, the KUSMA also improves our access for refined sugar, sugar-containing products, and certain dairy products into the U.S. The agreement also improves customs administrations and addresses some non-tariff barriers, so making things easier at the border and supporting greater regulatory alignment and reducing unnecessary barriers to trade. The agreement also modernizes certain origin procedures, so for example, um, electronic processes and simpler means by which to certify the origin of the good. Companies can also seek advance rulings on how their goods will be treated. Finally, all parties have agreed to maintain minimum de minimis thresholds for waiving customs duties and taxes on goods imported by courier from other Kuzma parties. Note, as I've mentioned on the previous slide, Canada did agree to additional quota access for dairy, egg, and poultry, and there are stricter rules of origin for autos, auto parts, and textiles. With respect to services, the KUSMA seeks to facilitate the trade and services by providing enhanced transparency, predictability, and leveling the playing field for service providers. Key commitments under the KUSMA include obligations on national treatment. This means that um, under the KUSMA, each party will treat service providers from the FTA region no worse than they treat their own. So the U.S. has to treat BC and Canadian service providers no worse than they treat American service providers. There are also obligations on most favored nations. So for example, if the US and Mexico were to give better treatment to other countries, they would have to extend that treatment to us as well. There are also some obligations on market access. This means, for example, that the three countries cannot introduce quantitative restrictions on service providers. So for example, they cannot suddenly say they will only allow a certain amount of professionals to practice in their territories. The KUSMA also uses a negative list approach. This means that all services are included in the agreement unless there are specific exception against them. Positive lists would mean that only those that are listed are included. You can see that a negative list approach is a lot more ambitious than a positive list approach. The KUSMA also seeks to improve transparency on licensing and qualifications and includes guidelines for mutual recognition agreements for the professional services sector. With respect to business entry, the KUSMA remains the access that was enjoyed under NAFTA, under the temporary entry chapter. So this is where um, the three parties recognize that the ability of business people to cross borders and to enter other markets is a key facilitator of trade and investment activities. So the level of access remains unchanged. It applies to four categories of business persons, so business visitors, traders and investors, intercompany transferees, and certain professionals there will be no labor market impact assessment requirement. Note, a work permit may still be required. Access applies to citizens only, and it also does not negate licensing or qualification requirements. We will share a website on the resources portion of the presentation that has information on the categories that are eligible, the criteria, where to apply, and so on. E-commerce is one of the big changes in how trade has been conducted since the original NAFTA came into effect in 1994. The KUSMA incorporates a new digital trade chapter, recognizing the importance that the digital economy, seeking to facilitate digital trade, and to build confidence in the digital trade is as a means of trade. Some of the highlights of the commitments include, parties will not discriminate against or impose customs duties or other charges on digital products. 
The Kuzma also allows the free flow of information across borders to do business and seeks to minimize data localization requirements. Note, however, there are still protections built into these for legitimate public policy objectives to protect data. Three governments have also agreed that they will not demand access to proprietary software source code. They've also agreed to facilitate public access to and use of open government information to support innovation and economic development. Moving on to investment, the Kuzma's investment chapter was updated to bring it into line with the recent treaty practices of the three parties. The chapter contains a comprehensive and robust set of obligations similar to those found in other FTAs, such as the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership. It includes standard commitments, such as national treatment, where parties agree to treat each other's investors no worse than their own, uh, most favored nation, MSN, so if one party gets another country better treatment, they will apply to us as well. There is also a minimum standard of treatment on how investors will be treated, so fair and equitable treatment based on international law, as well as rules around performance requirements. This means that uh, conditions like exporting a certain percentage of goods produced or transferring technology to the host country cannot be placed on the investment. Governments cannot also require companies to appoint um, senior managers of a particular nationality. However, governments can mandate that a majority of the boards of directors conform to nationality or residency requirements. Now, it's important to note that as with other areas of the agreement, there are exceptions to these commitments. So it's important to check what the exceptions are. This is something we can help you with. It's also important to note that the NAFTA's ISDS, the Investor State Dispute Settlement System, is being phased out. The original NAFTA ISDS mechanism will remain available to investors with respect to their existing investments under the NAFTA for a period of three years after the entry into force of Kuzma. With respect to labor and environment, the Kuzma, as I mentioned, brings environment and labor commitments into the agreement itself. Previously, these commitments were found inside agreements, and now they are part of the agreement and subject to the agreement's state-to-state -state dispute settlement. So not only is it the right thing to do to build on labor commitments and principles and maintain strong environmental laws, there is actually a strong economic reason for doing so on the continent. A key obligation that we've agreed to is non-derogation. That is, the three countries agree that they will not waive or weaken their labor or environmental laws in order to attract trade and investment. In the labor chapter, new areas of coverage include addressing violence against workers, eliminating sex-based discrimination, and promoting women's equality at work. The environment chapter includes obligations on several global environmental challenges. For example, sustainable forestry and fisheries management, reducing pollution, the ozone layer, air quality, biodiversity, and so on. It also seeks to facilitate the trade and investment in environmental goods and services. Importantly, in both the labor and environment chapters, failure to comply with an obligation is now presumed to affect trade or investment unless the defending party proves otherwise. This is expected to improve the enforceability of these chapters. With respect to inclusive trade, Seeking to ensure the benefits of FTAs accrue to as many people and segments of the population of the economy as possible. This is the intent of inclusive trade. This is a lens that was then increasingly applied to Canada's recent free trade agreements. For example, the agreement we have with the EU, um, the CPTPP, and now, of course, the Kuzma. Two areas that are covered by inclusive trade include gender and Indigenous peoples. So one way that the Kuzma promotes inclusive trade is through encouraging collaboration to enhance opportunities for small and medium-sized enterprises that are owned by underrepresented groups, including Indigenous peoples and women. It also encourages addressing barriers that limit the full participation of women in the workforce, for example, um, obligations to provide job-protected leave for childbirth, adoption, and family care responsibilities, and protection against wage discrimination. The Kuzma also requires that parties implement policies that protect against gender-based discrimination in the workplace, specifically with regard to pregnancy, sexual orientation, sexual harassment, gender identity, and caregiving responsibilities. In a first for one of Canada's free trade agreements, handcrafted Indigenous textiles and apparel goods are eligible for duty-free treatment, provided that any requirements agreed to by the importing and exporting parties are met. Note. 
the Kuzma does not impact a country's legal obligation towards Indigenous peoples. This is something that continues to be protected in all of Canada's free trade agreements. With that, I'd like to pass things over to Ghana, who will briefly talk about our other FTAs and key developments in the FTA landscape. Thank you, Chelsea. So whether it is Kusma free trade agreement with Europe or South Korea, Canada now has 14 FTAs that cover 51 countries. This map shows where in the world Canada's FTAs have been implemented. These countries are shown in light blue, the US, the European Union, Australia, where the free trade uh, negotiations have been concluded, these countries are in dark blue, like Malaysia, and where exploratory discussions and negotiations on potential FTAs are taking place. And these countries are in green, for example, Brazil, China, India, Turkey. In purple, you will also see the countries that have both in force and not yet ratified FTAs with Canada. And this is the case of Chile and Peru. Canada has a key first mover advantage as the only country to have free trade agreements with all other countries in the G7. The US, the UK, France, Germany, Italy and Japan. And Canada is also the only G7 country with preferential FTA access to the world's two largest economies, the European Union and the US. Uh, the good thing is that Canada has been very active in creating these preferential trade alliances with uh, its trading partners, but this preference we know will not last forever. For example, the European Union has recently concluded an FTA with Vietnam, and it is also in um, preferential trade agreements with Singapore and Japan, and the US has reached uh, a phase one agreement with, uh, with Japan too, and so on. So it is important to take advantage of the preferential trade agreements now. And I also wanted to mention that Canada has two domestic free trade agreements, Canadian free trade agreement and new West partnership trade agreement. So moving to the recent developments in the FTA landscape. Uh, I first wanted to mention uh, Brexit and the uh, CETA. So Canada agreed to extend the Canada-European Union Comprehensive Economic and Trade Agreement, CETA, to the UK during the UK's transition period from the European Union. Uh, so until the end of this year, the C companies will continue to have CETA access to the UK. If no trade agreement is negotiated between Canada and the UK during the transition period, and the transition period of the UK from the European Union is not extended, once this transition period ends, trade with UK and Canada will be on the UK global tariff and WTO terms. And these terms are a bit less preferential than the terms under the CETA. So if you're interested in the UK market and know of any trade barriers there and any market access that would be important to maintain in the eventual Canada-UK free trade agreement, please send us this information. It's important for us to know of sectors and companies' interests when we prepare for negotiations. So uh, some developments in the Comprehensive and Progressive Agreement for Trans-Pacific Partnership, uh, known as CPTPP. So the CPTPP entered into force uh, at the end of uh, 2018 and is one of the Canada's most recently implemented FTAs. Uh, it has been ratified uh, by seven countries so far, Australia, Canada, Japan, Mexico, New Zealand, Singapore, and Vietnam. Um, and while many tariffs were removed immediately on day one of this agreement, some tariffs are removed in stages over several years. And now we are in the year three of the tariff reductions under the CPTPP. So there might bring some additional advantages to, to your business. It is also important to note that the trade area uh, may expand since other countries in the regions have expressed their interest in joining the CPTPP. Thailand, South Korea and even the UK. So a couple of words on Canada-Ukraine free trade agreement which entered into force in uh, August 2017. Um, it is covering goods only so far and before the pandemic, there were public consultations on its possible modernization, um, namely to include services sector. 
So why is it important to, to be seen? Uh, well, BC exports more to Ukraine than any other Canadian province. And the discussions uh, have been slowed down because of the pandemic, but moving forward, officials will continue to engage with the public and stakeholders on a possible postmodernization. modernization And same with the, as with the UK, uh, we encourage you to uh, let us know of any trade barrier or important market access to, to Ukraine. Um, and uh, I wanted to reiterate that during the pandemic, uh, Canada has um, said multiple times that it is committed to support Canadian and BC exporters in the free flow of goods um, across its borders. And it issued a number of joint statements with its key trading partners to confirm its positions. So now I wanted to hand it uh, to Ben to get you through the resources and contact details. Thank you, Gana. The next thing we want to do is walk you through some practical tools to assist you with navigating free trade agreements. This here is a screenshot from Canada's Tariff Finder website. It's a handy tool for figuring out what sort of tariffs your products will face in a market or what tariffs someone would pay when bringing a good into Canada. It is user-friendly and specifically for the markets with which Canada has FTAs. So this could be used for FTAs other than Kuzma as well. All you need to begin is the market you are interested in and the product you want to export or import. You can find your product by HS code if you know that. Uh, or through a keyword search. And if you put in uh, a keyword search uh, or an HS code, the system will probably ask you a couple of questions to determine precisely which product uh, you are interested in finding a tariff for. Okay, the next thing I'm going to do is walk through some examples using Canada's Tariff Finder. And uh, the first example we'll, we'll go through is peanuts to the United States. So we'll get started here. And uh, as you can see, I've already chosen the United States as the export market, and it indicates that Kuzma is the relevant FTA there. And uh, as I mentioned, you can search by your product by both HS code or keyword. And let's just imagine that we already know our HS code, which I have put into the uh, lead line here, and let's see what this brings up. Uh, so as you can see, this is uh, the code for peanuts, not roasted or otherwise cooked. And so we will select that code to indicate that that is the one that we are interested in. And uh, once you've uh, identified the product that you are curious about, uh, it brings you up a description of the product and some notes here are, uh, regarding the tariffs and uh, rules of origin. And um, down at the bottom is where you will see a chart and uh, information breakdown on the types of tariffs that that product currently faces. So we mentioned MFN rate earlier, and as you can see, that rate is 131.8%. And uh, as you can see below that, uh, you can see the rate under Kuzma. And so uh, beginning uh, this year, which is of course the first year that uh, Kuzma went into force, uh, that rate is 109.8%, which of course is quite low, uh, much lower already from the MFN rate. Uh, but you can also see that uh, over time, this rate is gradually decreasing under Kuzma on this product. Uh, and to the point where by 2025, the tariffs uh, will be zero. So this product will enter the US market tariff free uh, in, in, under Kuzma. Uh, you can also choose to compare uh, the US market with another market with which we have an FTA, and that's uh, up here. You can, at the top left of the screen, you can choose the add to compare um, and uh, see how tariffs uh, compare to other markets. Let's go back now and try one more example. Uh, we are going to see if we can uh, try something to Mexico, and let's say we are interested in chicken. And for our sake, we're going to be interested in um, whole fresh chicken. And let's see if we can get a see if this brings up anything for us. So if we just type in whole fresh chicken as keywords, 
Uh, what this brings up for us is uh, uh, HS code of 0307, 1101, and let's say that that's uh, the product that you are specifically interested in. Uh, if we do this, uh, we get the same thing, a, uh, a description of the product at the top, and if you scroll down, you can see the uh, comparison. And uh, what you see here is kind of, uh, kind of interesting. What uh, the tariff rate for this product going into Mexico is 75% uh, under the most favored nation uh, status. Uh, under Kuzma, uh, that rate is the same. So there really is no advantage to Kuzma when it comes to whole fresh chicken to Mexico. It's the same rate. And under the CPPP, as you can see, um, kind of uh, oddly, the rate uh, as of 2018 was much higher than the 75%. So clearly, if that were the same uh, at the time of uh, seeking to export that product to Mexico, you would, of course, just choose the MFN rate because it was much more, uh, much better than the rate under the CPTPP. Um, but as you can see over time under the CPTPP, this rate is also going down to the point where uh, as of 2024, the rate will be lower than the current MFN rate, and it will become advantageous for you to use the CPPPP provisions to export this product to Mexico. Uh, and of course, uh, by 2027, the tariffs on this product will actually be uh, down to zero tariff rate. So that's because Mexico is uh, Canada and BC businesses have access to Mexican market preferential access under both the CPPPP and Kuzma. Now you might be wondering why this rate here is much higher than the MFN rate. And there are a couple of potential explanations for that. Uh, one is um, the MFN rate may have actually decreased since the, uh, the rates were negotiated under the CPPP. As noted earlier, to benefit from a preferential tariff rate though, your good must qualify as originating in a Kuzma party. Customs authorities will not automatically grant preferential tariff treatment on a shipment of goods. Preferential tariff rates must be claimed by the importer. To claim tariff preference under Kuzma, exported goods must be accompanied by a certification of origin. The certification of origin has no prescribed format, but instead consists of a set of minimum data elements like the certifier's name, telephone number, the applicable tariff classification code, uh, rule of origin, and so on. Now, unlike some of our other FTAs, for preferential treatment under the Kuzma, certification can be completed by the importer, exporter, or producer. It may apply to a single shipment of a good or multiple shipments of identical goods. The certification is added to other commercial documentation and is valid for one year upon issuance, and it can be sent to the importer electronically. Sometimes it isn't clear how a good should be classified or whether a good satisfies the rules of origin. In this case, you may wish to consider applying for an advanced ruling. An advanced ruling is a written statement issued by the relevant customs authority, uh, that is where that product is entering a market, attesting to a product classification or that it meets uh, the rule of origin. So if you're looking for certainty that your product meets the rules in the United States, you must apply to the US Customs and Border Patrol. The authority must abide by its decision, and Guzma outlines the information required for a ruling and the timelines applicants can expect for a decision. Please note, the issuance of an advanced ruling does not negate the requirement for an importer to have a certificate of origin in its possession at the time goods are imported. And please know that NAFTA origin advanced rulings are no longer valid. You must now apply for a Kuzma origin advanced ruling if you think that one is needed. On tariff rate quotas, uh, the application period for the initial Kuzma supply managed TRQs has passed, but the link here is a good place to visit for updates on the process and future application periods. And finally, on temporary entry, the link that you see on the screen here uh, contains details of temporary entry under the Kuzma. Like rules of origin, these rules can be complex, uh, and we're here to walk you through these and, and any other aspects of FTOs. The Trade Commissioner Service has something called a, um, a trade reporting a trade barrier. And this website allows you to um, uh, raise awareness to a trade barrier that you've experienced. Trade barriers, of course, include uh, administrative procedures, 
quantitative restrictions such as quotas, price controls, licensing requirements, and product labeling requirements. Uh, and they can take two forms, really, tariff and non-tariff. Now, it's important to remember that not all regulations and procedures uh, are considered a trade barrier. Some regulations make sense, such as those aimed at protecting public health or the environment. Now, when you are facing a legitimate barrier, though, this website makes it very easy to report them. You might think that others are probably experiencing the same barrier and have already raised it and that there's no sense in raising it. But this is not necessarily true. Uh, if everyone thought the same way, then uh, then it's possible that that barrier has not been raised and that um, the relevant authorities are not aware of it and can and therefore not do anything about it. So it's always helpful for governments to get that additional detail and to know that more businesses are experiencing a certain barrier. Okay, now let's move on to uh, some of the other trade services. Uh, this here is, um, uh, of course, something that the federal government offers, uh, which is in the form of the Trade Commissioner Service. They are located across Canada and the world and have a team dedicated to British Columbia. Uh, in fact, they have more than 1,000 uh, reps in 160 cities globally. The Trade Commissioner Service really offers four key services without cost to Canadians looking to enter new world markets. And that's preparation for international markets, uh, market potential assessments, uh, the identification of qualified local contacts, and commercial problem solving. So uh, all of the contact information for the VC office is listed on the screen here, and you can use that to uh, reach out to them directly if you have any questions. And BC has its own trade support services dedicated to BC businesses like yours. Uh, if you are not yet in touch with export advisors from the Export Navigator program, I strongly encourage you to use their free support and ongoing guidance to help your business grow outside of BC. They offer businesses access to community-based export specialists who can provide a personalized step-by-step -step approach to exporting and help connect your business to market information, export programs, financial services, and business development experts. Now, another useful support service is BC's trade and investment representatives with offices in many countries, including in the US, the Asia Pacific, and Europe. Uh, and their role is really to provide local market knowledge and intelligence. Uh, to identify key contacts in markets and to assist at targeted trade shows and with visits to market. Uh, these representatives also help international businesses discover the benefits of BC as a destination for investment, a partner for trade and innovation, and source of quality goods, services, and resources around the world. I will now turn it over to Will Fox to talk about British Columbia's United States Trade and Investment Representative Office. Will. Great, thank you, Ben. Uh, good day, everyone. It's a real pleasure to uh, be visiting with you all uh, this afternoon. My name is Will Fox. I'm the Managing Director in the United States on behalf of BC's Trade and Investment Representatives. I've been uh, fortunate enough to represent the great province of British Columbia here in the United States going on nine years and have met some wonderful companies, wonderful people, wonderful government officials throughout the process. And we have been doing great work in the United States on behalf of British Columbia. Our job is to look after British Columbia companies that are coming into the United States that want to sell their projects, their services, their products, as well as our job is to try to find companies that are interested in growing a presence in British Columbia and employing local British Columbia folks in the in the uh, in the opportunities. So we have been fortunate enough to grow the uh, footprint of British Columbia in the United States and go and and showcase the wonders of the province. So starting with the Pacific Northwest, we have Troy DeFrank, who is based in our Seattle office, and Troy has been with us now for approximately three years and came to us from the Canadian consulate there, the Canadian consulate there in Seattle. And uh, he's got a wealth of information and knowledge to be able to work with a lot of investors, a lot of tech companies, 
and really being on the border there, he's been able to bring a variety of opportunities into the province and, and bringing up investors, whether it's to the BC Tech Summit over the years on the Geeks for Train, or one time we was able to bring in um, investors on Geeks on a float plane where they came into Victoria and was able to uh, work with them. So anybody that's needing representation in the Seattle Pacific Northwest marketplace, Troy DeFrank is our person on the ground. If you go down south on the west coast, we have uh, Tate Turner and Megan Blatton, both representatives in the San Francisco Silicon Valley arena. They've both been with us as well for approximately three years, and they both have extreme experience in the trade and investment arena. Megan comes from the Canadian consulate there in San Francisco, where we were able to uh, bring her over onto our team. And before that, she was also a representative for uh, a variety of different economic development uh, entities throughout the world. She and Tate Turner, who uh, comes to us from the UKTI, the United Kingdom Trade and Investment Office, he was with them for a variety of years and brings a wealth of knowledge of, of opportunities that are there in the in the Silicon Valley slash San Francisco arena. There is a tremendous amount of venture capital, as we all know, in Silicon Valley, and it is a great place for companies in BC who have come down in the years past to look for uh, early stage seed or Series A funding for their companies, along with a tremendous amount of interest of companies that want to expand their operations into British Columbia, into the Vancouver or Victoria or Kelowna markets and any other locations that are, are of interest to them. You go continue further south and you have Alana Wagner and Alana is based in our Los Angeles office and Alana has been with us almost uh, uh, for over seven years now. And she has got a wealth of experience in life sciences, digital media, entertainment sector, and uh, she came to us from the province of Ontario, where she did about six years plus of uh, economic development as well with them. And then in Sacramento, California, we have Marilyn Wright. That's the Sacramento is the state capital of California. And Marilyn's been with me for seven years as well. And she has been our program manager, but also very importantly, she spends half of her time working on the agri-food uh, sector. So she has been a participant in the Boston Seafood Show, the fancy Winter Fancy Food Show in San Francisco, and then uh, the the uh, expo down in the Natural Products Expo down in Anaheim for all these years. So Marilyn is our go-to person when you have agri-food, agri-tech opportunities where you want to sell your products. She's working with brokers. She's working with buyers from a variety of different chains here in the United States. As you go to the east, the east coast was uh, is with Chris King. He's been with us over five years. We did a study many years ago to take a look at uh, the opportunities that might exist on the east coast on behalf of British Columbia. We found that uh, many of the other provinces of Canada were already represented there. So we decided that it was time for us to to put a person in place there. And so Chris is based out of Boston, and really covers the Boston and New York City. Uh, communities quite extensively. He does go down the coast and has been in uh, Virginia. He's been in Washington, D.C., and actually has gone as far south as Florida with a couple of connections and opportunities there. But when we say East Coast, it's pretty much everything there. But the main corridor is between Boston and New York City, which, again, has a plethora of opportunities for British Columbia companies to come in and do trade and investment in, into those communities. Chris is a well-connected person who comes with years of experience with also from the UKTI as well as uh, uh, London East Partners. And he has uh, a, a tremendous amount of energy that is beneficial for somebody who's doing business on the East Coast. East Coast obviously is a little bit different. It's a little bit more hyperkinetic than the West Coast. I mean, West Coast is a plethora of opportunities. East Coast as well, but there's a lot of, um, uh, life sciences, communications, ICT, a tremendous amount of, of wealth advisors in the New York City opportunity there as well. 
So that's our team. And uh, we all report into Sila Sahin, who is our senior manager. She's based there in Vancouver, British Columbia. And she has been with us for over a year. And we report in directly to her. And she is our air traffic control. Uh, so anybody who wants to come to us goes to her. So anybody in the province that's interested in getting hold of us, we recommend that you go to Sila Sahin, senior manager of the uh, Ministry of Jobs, Economic Development, and Competitiveness. And she will then get you in touch with us. I think that's it for now. And I really appreciate uh, visiting with you all today. Thank you so much. Great, thanks, Will. That is it for our presentation. Uh, our trade policy and negotiations branch is here to support you and can help uh, answer any questions that you might have. Uh, we are always interested to hear about any barriers you are encountering in Canadian and international markets. Uh, we can seek to address them and can advocate with the federal government that they be addressed. Uh, or we can put you in touch with the people that you need to get your goods and services to market. Uh, on this slide here, you can see uh, our, our contacts uh, as well as the contacts of the our trade readiness and services branch. Um, they are responsible for the export navigator program uh, and would be the folks that would accompany you on business missions and trade shows if that's the type of support that you're looking for. Uh, and you can also see the contact information uh, for BC's trade and investment representatives, including the main director, as well as the uh, the specific contact for the manager for the U.S. trade off, uh, office. Uh, that is it for our presentation. Uh, thank you very much for listening.